In this inspirational and highly informative live lecture presented to a group of chiropractic professionals, Dr. Wayne Dyer offers his penetrating wit and wisdom on how to develop your own healing powers, as well as that of others. Dr. Dyer emphasizes that the secrets to healing are not somewhere out there, but rather healing is something that takes place inside each and every one of us, occurring when we connect to our source and bring spirit to the disease. He emphasizes that healers need to be able to banish doubt and see their clients as individuals who already possess the capacity to heal themselves. That is, those with health challenges need to have someone in their energy field who truly believes that healing can take place. Dr. Dyer explains how to operate at the higher level where doubt and ego consciousness don't exist. And he also relates fascinating and entertaining stories based on his own personal life interactions with kahunas, yogis, and other powerful individuals, and the world of spirituality and alternative healing. And now, Hay House is proud to present Dr. Wayne Dyer and Secrets of Your Own Healing Power. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was uh, upstairs this morning reading uh, USA Today. I don't know if any of you saw the Tuesday edition of USA Today, um, where the lady whose daughter has been in a coma for 30 years, did any of you see that? Um, how she has cared for her in an unconditional, loving way, is a uh, story that I wrote a, uh, a book about four or five years ago called The Promise is a Promise. Thirty years ago, this um, woman, Kay O'Bara, was speaking uh, to her daughter in the hospital as she was slipping into a diabetic coma. And she said to her daughter, looked at her and said, you won't leave me, will you, Mommy? And her mother said, I would never leave you, I promise and a promise is a promise. And 30 years later, she has been caring for her daughter, who is not on life support. Um, every two hours, she has to be fed. And every four hours, she has to have uh, an injection of insulin. She's never slept in a bed. She's never bought herself any clothes or even been to a movie. And when I saw that story five years ago, I. Uh, decided that I would uh, make contact with her and, and write her story. And when I appeared with her on Oprah Winfrey a couple of years ago, Oprah said to her, why do you do this? Because it's been going on for 30 years now. She said, I do it because um, God asked me to do it. And God never asks you to do any more than you can handle. And the show was about people who had been in comas for a long period of time. And all of them had been on the show and were complaining and talking about how difficult it was and what a struggle it was and what a burden uh, it was to have someone that you had to care for who was uh, in such a state. And when Oprah asked her, she said, uh, it's not a burden, it's my honor to serve my daughter and to serve God in this way. And in a deep meditation a couple of years later, I wrote a, uh, I asked what I could do to help them to get out of the debt that they had amassed. And I wrote a book in, in two weeks telling her story called A Promise is a Promise. And uh, now I think Oprah is going to do a full hour with her and tell a story of unconditional love unmatched in any that I've ever known. When my wife and I walked into that room for the very first time, it was as if we had entered into a sanctuary, a place where unconditional love had been being practiced. And I'll bring it around here as I speak to you this afternoon uh, on the importance of this notion of unconditional love as one of the pathways that we have to go through on our way to mastery. And I was proud to write this book and have all of the profits and royalties and proceeds and everything go directly to them. 
and um, we're slowly helping to get her out of debt. But the most astonishing thing of all, and the part that they left out of the newspaper story, which I thought was interesting, was that um, she talks to and sees the Blessed Mother. And whether you believe it or not is not of any concern or relevance to her whatsoever. She feels the Blessed Mother is there with her. And there are people who have been in her presence who have been healed of um, tumors and things like this. And one of her kindergarten, she was a school teacher before her daughter went into the coma. And um, she uh, had a kindergarten student. Her name was Joy. And Joy found out about what had happened uh, many, many, many years later. She is now a mother of uh, two, actually three children now. And two of them have cystic fibrosis and have been being treated for cystic fibrosis for four years. And one day, Kay told Joy, who has dedicated her life to helping Kay out. She's there almost every single day, helping her with the feeding and helping her with the grocery shopping and, and all of these kind of things. One day, Kay um, came to Joy, and she said to her, she said, uh, your children no longer have cystic fibrosis. And Joy said, what do you mean? She said, I talked to the Blessed Mother last night. And um, she said that they have now been healed and that they no longer have this disease. Well, Joy was crying and sobbing and all that, and went, of course, to, back to her medical doctors. And her doctors confirmed that they no longer could find any indication of cystic fibrosis. So in the original story that was written, the doctors said that she had been misdiagnosed. I called the doctors and asked them if they had been misbilled. <laughs> because for four years they were treated for having cystic fibrosis and now they're completely free of it. And that miracle and others were not told in the story, which is of interest to me. But anyway, in today's USA Today, um, there's a story of a man who's opening tonight here in Las Vegas at the Orleans Hotel showroom. His name's Jerry Lewis. You've probably heard of him. <laughs> and he's now 73 years old, and he's going to perform a two-and-a-half-hour break free with a 30-piece orchestra beginning tonight and four times a year. Now, this is a man who tried to commit suicide uh, about six years ago and talked about it. And he had a gun in his mouth, and he came within a second of pulling that trigger and killing himself. As he says in here, 11 specialists looked at him. He had been suffering from uh, meningitis when he was on his Australian tour, and he had been medicated for everything from balance and hearing and hypertension, blood pressure, getting dizzy, and so on. And today, he's completely free of all of that. He says to keep in shape, he works out on a treadmill in the morning and a bike at night. I nap 20 minutes during the day and I, when I can, and it does wonders. He's also producing a, uh, a remake of The Bellboy. And every day, he says, I get up and I feel like a winner. And you know what the 11 specialists who looked at him all said? He's been over-medicated. He's now medication-free. Medication-free. And he's also free of hypertension, imbalance, and all of the things that have been driving this man for the last 10 or 15 years into a state of literal insanity, as he's talked about it. It's a, um, it's a way I wanted to open today, because I think your profession, of course, understands and knows the value of treating people in a way in which we understand that the uh, healing is something that takes place inside each and every one of us, and that there's a stream of healing that is available to all of us. And I have been working for the last, oh, four or five months on uh, the beginning of a new book, and I'm calling it, uh, There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem. And while I have time here to speak to you, and I'm honored to do so, this is the fourth or fifth time, 
And I'm not here to tell you how to be better chiropractors. I'm not here to tell you how to be better healers even. As a young man was very dramatically impacted by a teacher some of you have heard of, some of you studied. I was blessed to know he passed away. And I felt that when he passed away, he was passing a baton on and handing it to me saying, I've sort of explained this to the academic world, this concept of self-actualization and enlightenment and higher consciousness and higher awareness. Now you take it and run with it and explain it to the cab drivers and the pizza delivery people and the accountants and the chiropractors and everybody that's out there that we call common folks. His name was Abraham Maslow. And Maslow was very influential in my life. He was the first person that I ever read that I felt uh, touched and talked to my soul. He, um, he emphasized the importance of always looking at what is possible for a human being on the basis of the greatest who've ever walked among us, rather than on us making assumptions about people and their capacity to heal themselves or their capacity to grow or their capacity to be great geniuses as being based upon what is wrong with people. He quoted Kierkegaard often, who said that once you label me, you negate me. Once you put any kind of a label on me, whatever you call it, whether it's as a hypertension, as Jerry Lewis was called, hypertensive, whether it's as uh, a slow learner, whether it's as non-musical, or any kind of a label that you can come up with, when you place a label on a human being, you negate them and you begin to treat the label, you begin to treat the uh, thing that you've identified them with. And Maslow said that rather than studying all of the things that are wrong with people and all the things that we can't do, let's instead focus on the greatest who've ever walked among us, these powerful people who've lived self-actualized lives, and let's make assumptions about what is possible for all of humanity that if any one of us can do it, all of us can do it. And that's right out of the scriptures. As Jesus said, even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. It's in every one of us. This power to see ourselves as saints. This power to see ourselves as capable of accomplishing virtually anything that we put our attention on. This capacity to manifest. This capacity to be able to use our mind to create anything at all, whether it's abundance or a divine relationship or a healing or anything in between. And that there are certain qualities or characteristics that people who share this idea of self-actualization have that I will be talking about a little bit later on this afternoon. And as you look at some of these qualities, you will see that uh, these were people that do not fit in. I'm so thrilled to have written Wisdom of the Ages because it's, all, it's the book I've always wanted to write. I always wanted to take a look at, at people who I have admired so much. Not one of them died with their music still in them. Not one of them. Every one of them lived lives of incredible passion. And they were all troublemakers in their lifetime. It's funny how we, as a society, have a tendency to honor our living conformists and our dead troublemakers, isn't it? <laughs> it's almost as if you have, to be, you have to be wiped out before we can revere you. And the qualities and characteristics of these people, I don't want to get into now because I want to move in a little different direction. But I want to share with you how powerful this idea of looking at a patient or looking at yourself or looking at your child as a parent and seeing the potential for magnificence and sainthood that is there and seeing the capacity for healing if you're a chiropractor or if you are uh, in 
the healing professions. Seeing anybody that walks into your office as already possessing the capacity to be able to heal themselves, but they need to have in their energy field someone who will not contaminate it further with their idea that they are diseased or that there is something wrong with them. It is in the energy field of the healer that determines whether healing will take place, in my humble opinion. And it is what we believe and how strongly we believe it. And I did a, um, a very special uh, benefit on Maui a few years ago for a young man named Michael Knopf. And Michael was um, 32 years old, living on Maui, living his dream. Like my little boy, who was 12, tells me, Dad, he said, would it really upset you, he said, if I just wanted to be a professional skateboarder and surfer? Because that's his whole life. He goes through a pair of shoes every two weeks because he wears them out with that skateboarding stuff of his. And everywhere he goes, he's grinding, all right? He's got this board, and he's on it, and he's lifting it up and flipping it in the air. And, uh, and that's his whole life. And I always tell him, Sam, if, uh, if that will make you happy and you, uh, you feel fulfilled in your life, skateboarding and surfing, God bless you. You, you don't have any expectations of mine to live up to at all especially that I would support you. <laughs> but if you can figure out a way to make a living at it, boy, God bless you, go for it. Anyway, Michael was uh, a surfing instructor, and he was a um, lifeguard and a waiter, and he was living his dream, a dream that um, I've sort of had at the back of my mind for a long time, the idea of living in that beautiful place in Maui, because I've conceived... Uh, five of my books on Maui, and four of our children. Uh, <laughs> it's a very high-energy place. <laughs> and one day he was um, out in the surf over by Kihei, and uh, a wave was coming in, and someone had thrown a Frisbee. And in the process of throwing the Frisbee, uh, he dove for it. And instead of the wave continuing to come in, this is one wave out of a million, it reversed, and it went back. And in that instant, when that wave went back, he dove and he severed his neck, and he's uh, a quadriplegic like Christopher Reeve, only he does have movement with his arms. And, uh, and he was rendered a, uh, a newborn, with all the needs of a newborn in that instant. And a friend of his called me, and ask, since I was on the island for the summer, if I would come over and give a talk, something like this, if they would charge people $25 or whatever, and if, they would, uh, if we would donate all of the proceeds to helping him to go to the Miami Center for the Study of Spinal Cord Injuries and do a full assessment and so on, and, uh, and, and also purchase a van for him. And so I did that along with my friend Jerry Jampolsky. And at the end, it was a wonderful evening. It was very successful, and we raised all the money that was necessary. And at the end of the talk, there was a man who uh, lives on Kauai who came, um, who came up to me afterwards. And he, um, he was introduced to me as a kahuna. Now, kahuna is considered to be a great healer. And they're raised in a tradition of being healers. And healing is something that has been very, very much on my mind in the last um, year or two. Um, I've had some very dramatic experiences with it. I've had some people who were told that they wouldn't survive, who have recovered completely. And I've been studying um, some of the ancient healing principles as I'm writing this book about a spiritual approach to uh, to everything in our life, a spiritual solution, rather, to everything in our life. And I have written down, and I intend to share them with you, uh, seven very profound and, and important principles, which probably you weren't taught at uh, chiropractic school, which um, 
have come to me from some ancient sources that I'll share with you today. And I will read them to you if I don't talk about them in depth. And this kahuna was a clear man. You know what I mean when I say clear? Have you ever been around someone whose energy field you know is more purified than your own? They said of Jesus that when he would walk into a village, just his presence in the village and nothing more would raise the consciousness of those around him just by being in his presence. They said that of Buddha. I have been with people who are vibrating at a different um, frequency, if you will, than ordinary human awareness. And when I'm around those people uh, and in their presence, I sense something that is non-contaminating. Not only that, but it is life-enhancing. And you feel uh, what they call an, a kundalini, like a, an energy moving up and down. I call it like a warm shower running inside of you. Have you ever had that feeling where you just, and you just know there's something going on inside. You're not sure quite what it is, but it just feels so good that you don't want it to stop. And very often it's because you're in the presence of the energy of someone like that, or you are thinking about someone like that, or perhaps meditating about someone like that, or concentrating at such an intense level that um, that, that kundalini is moving, that energy, that chi is moving up and down. Well, that's what they say of these people. And, uh, and I felt this with this gentleman who was uh, raised in Polynesia and had been a kahuna. And I said to him, sort of half-jokingly, how do you get to be a kahuna? Do you, do you take kahuna 101? I mean, do you, you know, because people just come to you and they, they trust you and you lay hands on them or you talk to them or whatever it is and you are known as a healer in these uh, sort of, in quotes, primitive uh, societies. And he said, well, there are two things that we are taught when we are raised as kahunas. He said, the first thing that we are taught is to never have any doubt. I call this the, one of the keys to higher awareness in, in real magic, the banishment of doubt. But it isn't like you've been raised on doubt, because most of us have been raised on doubt about what is possible and what we can do and who we are and what our destiny is and uh, what is possible for us and so on. We're raised to believe that there's certain people and certain things that can do these things and certain people and certain things that cannot. And getting away from that uh, conditioning is one of the more difficult things to move into a higher level of awareness. I'm not talking about being raised on doubt and then learning how to banish it. I'm talking about being raised with no doubt at all. I remember when, we were, when my wife and I went into a remote village in Bali. And uh, as we were going into the village, nobody was wearing any clothes. The women were... Um, balancing uh, pots on their head. It was very, very uh, non-Western place, way, way out in, uh, in a remote area of Bali in Indonesia. And at the entrance to the gate of the village, there was an old man, and he was lying there, and he was looking up at the, uh, at the sky, and he was chanting and making some noises. And I said to the there was only one person in the whole village who spoke English who had, uh, who had arranged for my wife and I to visit this place. And I said to her, who is that? What is he doing? He said, oh, he's a, uh, a cloud mover and a cloud maker. He makes the clouds. I said, what? He said, yeah, he's, he's a cloud maker. I said, well, what, what would you want a cloud maker for? He said, well, when there's periods of drought, his assignment, his job, what he does is he brings clouds and he brings precipitation and he will end the drought. And of course, my reaction, now that was maybe 15 years ago, my reaction, and I have been known as being pretty weird, as you'll find out if you stay with me today. <laughs> um, and when it gets real weird, I'll point it out so that you don't think I don't know <laughs> that this might sound a little strange. But um, at that moment, at that time in my life, even though I wanted to embrace that awareness or that notion that someone had the power to be able to alter natural forces, I still had an enormous amount of conditioned doubt that that's something that we have the capacity to do.
It was only when I began to move into a much more spiritual realm in my life when I began to realize that the same energy that moves a thought across my mind moves a cloud across the sky. There's only one. And the same energy that opens a flower in the morning beats my heart every day. And the same energy that moves the planets throughout the galaxies also allows a tiny little seed to become a human being. There's only one energy. And if there's only one energy in the world, one universal force, and it's in everything and it's everywhere, there's no place that it is not, then it's not outside the realm of even logic to assume that if it's in me and it's in the clouds, that if I could somehow banish the idea that I had the capacity to be able to use that same energy that's in the clouds that's in me to be able to bring about precipitation, if I had that capacity. And it's about banishing doubt. If there's any principle that is clear and profound and important in this presentation here to you today, it's in the ability to banish doubt from your contacts with those who need to be healed. They have got to enter into an energy field in which doubt is absent from the, the person who is doing the healing. That I am absolutely, totally convinced of. Now the second thing that this uh, kahuna said that they were taught. Now imagine he had been raised to have no doubt. So that this is someone who absolutely was convinced that if they uh, saw dogs barking and they wanted to stop them from barking, that they had the ability to do that. But they were told that as children. And if they, if they uh, wanted to be able to, uh, uh, to heal another person, they were told from the very beginning, you absolutely have that power to do that. They weren't any different than anybody else except that they never had been exposed to something being impossible. They'd never heard that. They'd never been a around that kind of mentality. So that kahunas had a different energy pattern when it came to healing. And if someone walks into your office and you see that person, whatever it might be, whether it's just a, uh, an adjustment that might be needed or what, whatever it might be, if you have a sense that I absolutely have no doubt that I can be of assistance to you, I know it and I can convey that to you, the healing process begins. But even if you have a 1% amount of doubt that you have the capacity to do anything there, you will act upon that 1% as well, and it will manifest. As we think, so shall we be. You cannot talk about healing without talking about God, I don't think. I don't think you can talk about healing and higher levels of consciousness without speaking about spirituality. And I'm not speaking about religion here. I'm just speaking about spirituality, a higher level of consciousness. The second thing that this kahuna said is that, and he was, and I've never forgotten this, and I, I jotted it down and memorized it. And I've always used it, particularly with my own family, my own children, and with everyone that I come in contact. He said this. He said, when a knowing, a knowing, confronts a belief in a disease process, the knowing will always triumph. When a knowing confronts a belief in a disease process, the knowing will always triumph. So how do we get to the knowing? Before I'm introduced, whenever I speak, I always repeat an affirmation from A Course in Miracles. And this affirmation goes like this. It says, if you knew, it doesn't say if you believed. It says, if you knew, a knowing means an absence of doubt. If you knew who walked beside you at all times on this path that you have chosen you could never experience fear or doubt again. 
And I remind myself of that as I take the microphone. And if I'm going to speak for a weekend or 20 minutes or anything in between, I always remind myself that I'm not alone, that I am connected to something that I am a part of. And it doesn't matter what you call it. As Alan Watts said, you can't get wet from the word water. Whether you call it water or aqua or anything in between, Vazer. It's not what you call it that will make you wet. It's the substance of it. So whether you call this God or soul or spirit or consciousness is of no consequence. And it's shifting into that knowing. I've often said that when, um, when Jesus would approach a, uh, a leper, he wouldn't go up to the leper and say, you know, we haven't been having a whole lot of success here with leprosy lately. <laughs> it's really running rampant here. There are noses falling off. There are fingers in the ditch. This is not a pleasant sight. But I've got some advice, and I've got some herbs. And if you listen to my advice and you take these herbs, you have a 30% chance of surviving over the next five years. He would never say that. He said, walk, you are healed, rise, and healing would take place. And even the least among you can do all that I have done, and even greater things. And it's a very intriguing kind of idea, this, um, this notion of being in the in a state of mind in which you can have a knowing that is so profound that doubt can never enter into it. Now you have this knowing. I remember uh, when I first read uh, uh, the works of the Buddha, he said the first and most significant thing for any of us to know is to come to know something that cannot be destroyed by death. The most important thing that you can learn in your life, said the Buddha, is to come to know something that cannot be destroyed by death. Jung put it this way, he said, the, the telling question of your life is your relationship to the infinite. If you have one, you are on a path of higher awareness. If you don't, you're not. Do you have a sense of the infinite. When Lao Tzu was asked the question, what is real, Master, what is real, by his devotees and students. And Lao Tzu in the sixth century before Christ in China was considered to be God in a human form. He had that same ability, the, the gift of fish and loaves. He was the founder and the author of the Tao and Taoism, but he uh, he would perform miracles wherever he would go. Lights would come from him. He was uh, considered to be one of those light beings 600 years before the birth of Christ. And when they said, what is real, Master, what is real? He said, that is real, which never changes. Now you look at yourself and you try to find and define something about yourself that meets that criteria, that meets that definition. What about you has never changed? Is it your body? Certainly not mine. I hold a hair up on the pillow in the morning. I say to my wife, honey, this is the metaphysical question. Final answer. <laughs> what held it in yesterday? We have no idea. I've had this experience several million times. Huh? So the part of us that has never changed isn't even what we're aware of. It isn't even our mind. Our mind is changing all the time. The part of us that has never changed is called awareness. Awareness. Not what you're aware of, but awareness. And awareness is the unchangeable. 
It's the part of us that when we begin to live from there, we begin to make dramatic shifts in our consciousness and in our lives. About two months ago, I was in Cleveland, Ohio, and I was speaking for a uh, group of people that evening, and it was in the morning. It was about um, 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was doing a meditation, and I had been reading, I was reading from a book that I'll share with you uh, in, a, in a few moments. And in this meditation, I uh, got a vision that I should make a telephone call. And the number flashed across the screen of my inner world. And it was the number of my friend and his wife from um, 30 years before, whom I hadn't seen in about 30 years. And he was a, um, a medical doctor. His name was Dean. And his wife, her name was Linda, she was... Um, my girlfriend when I was in high school, the one that had promised when I went away that when I came back she would marry me. And she went to the University of Michigan and met this guy in medical school. And she married him. And I was really in love with Linda when I was in high school, from ninth grade to twelfth grade. I used to carry my world literature book in front of me. You remember? <laughs> every time I'd see her walking down the hall. <laughs> and um, I went into the Navy when I graduated, and she went up to Michigan and she met Dean. And they got married and had a family, and uh, we became uh, very good friends when I got back from the service, and I, started, I went to school in Detroit. Um, we started, uh, when I got married, and uh, we started uh, going on ski trips and uh, things together and so on. And I hadn't seen them in a long, long time, maybe 25 or 30 years. And the number just came right up. When I came out of the meditation, I called. And I dialed the number, 419. And uh, Dean answered the telephone. Now, it had been almost three decades since I've talked to them. And I said, Dean, what are you doing home? I was calling to talk to Linda. <laughs> And he said, well, he said, uh, you know, he has a practice. He's an internist, medical doctor in Sandusky, and he's been there for a long time. I don't know what happened, but he's now 64 years old, something. I don't know what that's about. He's now getting ready to retire. And I said to him, what, what are you doing home on a, uh, on a Friday morning? He said, well, he said, last week I had uh, surgery. I said, you had surgery? He said, yeah. He said, uh, for the last three years, I've been walking with a cane. And um, I haven't been able to get around. And I have, um, I had real bad rheumatoid arthritis in my hip. And I just had a hip replacement. I said, oh. He said, well, he said, yeah, I'm recovering now. He said, but next year, next March, which is a few months from now, he said, I'm going to have to have the other hip done. He said, then in a year or so, he said, I'm going to have to have my left knee done because it's really bad. And then probably down the road, I'll have to have the other knee done because I've got this arthritis, my lower extremity. I said, oh, that's really too bad. As I was getting depressed. I said, is Linda home? <laughs> he said, I uh, see you on TV every once in a while, and I've heard some of your tapes. And uh, he said, I understand that you uh, run a lot. I said, yes, I run every day. I run eight miles every day. And I've done that every day for, well, since 1976. And uh, he said, well, he said, that's a lot of running and a lot of wear and tear in the body. He said, you're a good candidate for a hip replacement yourself. I was really getting depressed with this conversation, wondering why I had even called. Huh? And I said to him right away, I will never have a hip replacement. And he said, you can't just say you'll never have a hip replacement. You can't just come out and say that. I said, well, I'm coming out and I'm saying it. <laughs> I will never have a hip replacement. He said, well, 
you could just get arthritis. I said, Dean, I don't do arthritis. I said, I will never get arthritis. He said, you can't just, you can't just make a statement like that, that you're just never going to get arthritis. I said, I just won't get arthritis. I don't, that's something I won't do in my life. He said, well, it's not possible for you to just, he said, you're just as arrogant as you were 30 years ago, for God, you know. And that was sort of the end of the conversation. And then uh, about a week or two later, I was at a, uh, at a benefit, uh, and a woman, Phyllis, and was there, and she was talking about her mother. And she was saying that her mother has Alzheimer's disease. And she's got it pretty bad, and she feels real, uh, real bad when she sees her mother going through what she's going through. And she said, but the worst part of it is, and Phyllis is my age exactly, she's 59. And she said, um, the thing of it is, I've been noticing that I've been forgetting things lately, and I'm very concerned that I'm going to get Alzheimer's myself. And then I don't know what Harvey would do, and I don't know, you know, what her husband and so on. And, and I said, well, why don't you just say that you're not going to get Alzheimer's? Why not just make that declaration? She said the same words as Dean. She said, you can't just come out and say you're not going to get Alzheimer's. You can't just come out and say something like that. I said, why can't you say that? She said, well, well then, well, what if I get it? I said, well, if you say you won't, then you won't get it. She said, well, don't you forget things? I said, yeah, I forget things. She said, well, aren't you concerned that you... I said, absolutely not. I said, I will never have Alzheimer's. She said, you can't just say you'll never have that. It was very, very disconcerting to her that I would make such a declaration, that I would be willing to say it with such a knowing that it would be impossible. She said, just play a little game with me. She said, what if, what if you do get it? I said, I won't play that game. I don't play that game. I don't entertain thoughts like that in my consciousness. It's just not there for me. She said, well, just, just for a minute, it's just a little, you know, just a, a little pretend game. She said, just, just assume that well, 20 years from now I come to you, I see you and you're 79 years old and, and, I, and you've got Alzheimer's. And I say to you, so what do you say now? I would say, who are you? <laughs> and why are you annoying me? Now, I don't say that to be belittling or to be uh, uh, disrespectful towards anybody who is uh, going through uh, hip and, and knee replacements or Alzheimer's or, uh, or anything else. What I suggest, and I know this might sound a bit radical, but probably not to this group, but nevertheless, I suggest that everything in the universe is energy. It's all energy. And, and I don't have to really explain that if you were to take this microphone, which appears to be solid, and we were to break it down, and we were to look at it and examine it at its basic energy level, that what we would discover, what we would find, is that it is a dance. And there's a vibration in there. And this, these molecules that are vibrating at a certain speed are vibrating at such a speed that we call solidity, that which is solid, if you will. And that um, there are faster and faster levels of vibration that are available. And that even something like sound vibrates at a little higher frequency, and then light at a much higher frequency, and then beyond light is... Um, what we call x-rays and things like this which vibrate at a fat and lasers which vibrate at a fat and ultimately we get to uh, the element or the area of, uh, of thought as a vibration a very 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 fast vibration and then spirit and that all of this is like at faster and faster and faster vibrational frequencies and then we come to what we call ordinary human awareness an ordinary human awareness is uh, if we, if just for the sake of discussion and nothing more, just for the sake of discussion, we'll call this energy vibration, this frequency that all of us are in this room vibrating at so that we can all experience each other with our senses, we'll call it 20,000 cycles per second. All right? So that 
there's this speed that we all, and our eyes can see it. And we know that when I am speaking up here, I am moving my voice box. And uh, there's this uh, thing in my throat called a uvula, and it's moving up and down. And as I throw out these vibrations into the air, you can't see any of them. But somehow, in each one of your ears, there are these little tiny fibers in the cochlea of your ear that are vibrating very, very fast. If I speak very high, they go even faster. And if I speak very low, they go low. And you can pick all of this energy up in the room without being able to see it, right? So I say something up here, and you're picking it up out there even though you can't get a hold of it. You know that there's energy, that there's vibration going on in this room. And there's vibration that goes on that the eyes can pick up, and so on. But ordinary human awareness, if we call it, let's say, 20,000 cycles per second, I would like to suggest that at 20,000 cycles per second, certain things occur. Certain things begin to happen in our lives. And disease is one of those. Arthritis is one of those. Cancer is one of those. Alzheimer's is one of those. Influenza is one of those. And that it all occurs at the physical level of approximately 18 to 22,000 cycles per second. It's all happening here in ordinary human awareness. And I'd like you to just imagine, if you will, for a moment, moving out of that level of frequency, that frequency uh, of 20,000 cycles per second, and moving into something called 80,000 to 100,000 cycles per second, in which you increase the rate at which you are experiencing energy in your life. And I'd like to suggest to you that when you reach this higher level of awareness, this level of consciousness that is not ordinary at all, that different things begin to happen in your life. And these things that are different in your life are that your perception changes and that your anticipation changes and that you can sense things coming that when you're at 20,000 cycles per second will hit you blindside, but you can see it coming. And that there are people who are living at 80,000 cycles per second on a regular basis who do not participate in crime, for example, because they can see it coming. They can anticipate it. They have a perceptual awareness that there's danger here, and they know how to move away from it. When Father Joseph in Magigoria was lined up in Croatia to be shot, because he wouldn't identify where the children were in the village in Croatia. This was just two years ago. And they lined him up in front of a firing squad and the bullets went right through his body. And they saw the bullets in the back of the place where he was standing and no injuries whatsoever in the front of his body. And they turned him into a saint. They made him a saint. And that's when he built the, the church in Medjugorje. If you build it, they will come build it out in the middle of a field. We just returned from Machu Picchu in Peru, where my wife and I took a group of 75 people. And we spent five days in Machu Picchu. Or in, we spent 10 days in Peru, and five of them up in Machu Picchu. And Machu Picchu is this uh, place that was not discovered by the West until 1911. It was built thousands of years ago. When the Spanish came through South America and did to the natives of South America what we did to the Native Americans in North America, just decimated their whole populations, our Holocaust, their Holocaust. They never found Machu Picchu. They never came there. It was discovered by accident up on this mountain peak in Peru. And somehow they had built a whole city, a whole sacred place two, three, four thousand years ago with boulders that all weighed over 50 tons. How they could possibly have ever gotten them up the mountains two or three thousand years ago is a mystery to everybody alive today. Still can't even fathom it. We can only get there now through airplanes and special trains and buses and so on. And these were peasants somehow getting, building a whole city, a sacred place. And when I tell you that walking around in Machu Picchu for those two or three, four days of just being there when I wasn't obliged to do other things, I had the greatest sense of well-being 
that I've ever known in my life. And as you begin to understand what begins to take place as you reach these faster vibrational frequencies, if you will, that things that we thought were outside of our capacity to even be able to understand, let alone experience and perform on a regular basis, you begin to know that you can indeed manage the coincidences of your life. That you have the ability to say to yourself and live it and do it with truth. And let me ask this question of this audience here, and, and don't and, and only raise your hand if it's truth. How many of you do not do accidents? I just don't have accidents. And I intend not to have accidents. I have no accidents. I don't do accidents. Let me see. Maybe 15% of the audience. There's an awareness that accidents are things that happen at 20,000 cycles per second. And when I say to audiences, I don't have accidents, I just don't do them. I have in the past, but I don't go there any longer. They say, well, what if somebody's coming right at you, going the wrong way on the freeway, or blindsiding you, or whatever? I say, I would perceive that in advance. I would know that, and I would move to make sure that that didn't happen. And if I did indeed have or experience something called an accident, then I would remind myself that I had slipped out of this higher vibrational pattern, this higher level of consciousness, and allowed myself to drift back into ordinary human awareness. And when you do, you are susceptible. You are susceptible to accidents. You are susceptible to arthritis. You are susceptible to disease processes. You are susceptible to disharmony. You are susceptible to all of the disses, disease, disharmony, discord that are in your life. And this is where my talk begins. Because I would like to suggest to you that disorder and disease and disharmony are all capable of being nullified and wiped out of your life when you shift your level of consciousness into a spiritual awareness. That it is spirit as it says in the New Testament, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. These things that I say unto you, these words that I say unto you, are spirit. That's from the New Testament. And that when you can see yourself and learn how to increase your frequency of vibration, to a point where you can manage coincidences. And the word coincidence is very interesting. In mathematics, the word coincidence means angles that coincide. It comes from coincide, coincide, coincidence. Angles that coincide in mathematics are said to be angles that fit together perfectly. If it coincides, doesn't it? It fits together perfectly. We have taken a word that means something that fits together perfectly, and we have interpreted it to mean that which comes together accidentally. We've exactly reversed. And that's sort of what I'd like you to do for uh, the remainder of the time that we have, is to just sort of willingly suspend disbelief, even though I know it's not necessary to say that to this audience. I know who I'm speaking to, and I know what you do, and, and, I, and I honor and celebrate what you do, and I support it very enthusiastically. As we begin to talk about higher levels of consciousness and shifting our, our awareness, it's, it's like I think the hardest thing for us to do is to get rid of our belief patterns. It was a, a Saturday afternoon about eight or nine months ago when Wisdom of the Ages had just come out. And I was very excited, as I still am, about... Um, the power of uh, being able to read one essay a day for 60 days and apply it and reach a level of enlightenment through reading. But reading has always been a, uh, an avenue for me to, to get to higher places. And I uh, got a telephone call from uh, a bookstore manager in Boca Raton, Florida, where I live. It was Liberty's Bookstore. And 
they had asked me if I would uh, please come over to the bookstore and sign 25 copies of the book that had come in. They would like to do a display of autographed books there at the store, and they knew that I lived in the city. Now, that day, I was scheduled to fly out the next morning, Sunday morning, to speak to a convention of school teachers up in Orlando on Sunday afternoon. And I had planned that day to just do some reading and some meditating and to look at what it is that I wanted to say to these educators. And I really didn't want to go anywhere. And my wife overheard me the conversation and I was saying, well, I don't know if I can get there now, but, uh, and from there I was going out on a two week public television tour. So I wasn't going to be back for a couple of weeks. I said, they were, they really wanted me over there before I took off. My wife said, honey, she said, uh, the four children, the four youngest children are, uh, all going to the movies tonight at Meisner Park, which is right next to Liberty. And they're open till midnight. She said, you could just pick the children up instead of me. And she said, and then you can just stop in the bookstore, uh, you know, when you pick up the children. I said, okay, I'll do that. So it'll be about 1040 at night when the movie got out. Now I had been reading a book the, when the phone rang by Carlos Castaneda called The Power of Silence. And I had underlined a passage in this book that, was, that really hit me very hard. And I wasn't quite sure why it hit me so hard. And then the phone rang and I got distracted and so on. And then that night I went and uh, I picked up all four children and I drove over right next to where the bookstore is and I told them, I said, look, I'm going into the bookstore right there. You'll see me. I said, see that stack of books? I'm just going to sign them and then I'm going to come back out and don't try to drive away in the car. They're 12, 13, 14, and 15, you know. I said, um, I'll be right back. So I parked in this sort of, this no parking uh, area right there in front of the store. And I could look at them and at the same time I could sign the book. And as I was standing there signing the books, this woman came up to me and screamed, oh my God, oh my God, it's Wayne Dyer. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, this is... And she just was just like insane. What are you doing here? I said, well, I have to be someplace, this is where I am. And she had a very thick, heavy uh, accent. I thought it was German, but she was Dutch. She said, this is the most amazing coincidence that ever has taken place in my life. And this is what she said. She said, I heard you speak in Amsterdam two years ago. And she said, at that talk, I was so impressed and so taken by what you had to say at that all day seminar she said that I went out and I got all of your books and I was, and she said about a year later my husband of 25 years walked out on me he left and married a younger woman some 25 years younger and left me with the four children and just took off she said I went into such a state of depression that I immediately went on um, uh, antidepressants and Prozac and things like that and then she said um, I couldn't eat and I lost uh, 25 or 30 pounds. And she said, I even tried to commit suicide. And I got into therapy. And she said, whenever I would talk to my therapist, cause she said, I would always talk about you in therapy. She said, the only thing I know about him is that he lives in Florida. She said, uh, my therapist said to me, why don't you fly to America and look him up? And, uh, and maybe because I can't do any more for you. You're just beyond me. I mean, because she was just always complaining and always hurt and so on. And she was getting sicker and sicker. She said, I got on a plane and I flew to Florida. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with it, geography or not, but that's a state, right? <laughs> and there are 19 million people who live in Florida. She said, I flew to Miami today and I rented a car and I drove up the coast and I was staying at that hotel right over there. She said, I decided to go to a movie and I went to the movie theater right over there. And then I came out of the movie theater and I knew you had a new book out, but it wasn't out in Dutch yet. And I thought, I'll walk into the bookstore and see if his new book is out. And maybe I'll be able to, through his publisher, I'll be able to find out where he lives. And I'm gonna see if I can call him and make it. And I walk into the bookstore to see if your new book is out and you're standing right here. She said, I have got to have you say something to me. You must say something to me. 
She said, this is just so overwhelming. And I said, uh, well, I'm going to have you call my secretary, which is what I always do in those situations. And she put her arms around me and grabbed me as tight as it could be. And she said, you are not putting me off on your secretary. She said, you have got to say something to me. I know that God sent me to this place in this moment for you to say something to me. Okay? So I said, well, the first thing I'd like to say to you is you have to let go of me. All right? <laughs> and also, I have four children over there, all of whom are capable of driving off in my new car. <laughs> And she said, okay, and she sort of backed off, and she said, uh, is there anything that you could say to me? She said, and I said, well, the most intriguing thing is that today I was reading a book in preparing to give a talk that I have to give in Orlando tomorrow. And I read a line that I underlined, and I didn't know why I underlined it, because it didn't even seem to have any relevance for school teachers. And I apparently underlined it, and you can now... As I tell you this, understand how much had to take place, how many shifts were taking place. My wife was going to pick up the children, I picked them up, the bookstore manager calling, the, the, all of these kinds of things, the lady flying, all of this being sort of connected in some mystical way that we don't quite grasp or understand, but it's still very powerful and very much there. And I said, this is what I read today, and it seems to be what you need to hear. And this is what Castaneda said. He said that he was on his way to becoming what is called a nagual, which is a term that means um, all that is knowable, all that is nameless, a sorcerer, in the true sense of the word sorcerer, meaning of the source, not witchy, not riding brooms, but of the source. And all the miracles that take place when you begin to live from the source. And this is what Castaneda said. He said, one day, I finally realized that I no longer needed a personal history. And just like drinking, I gave it up. And that, and only that, has made all the difference. Our personal histories the stuff that we bring to every moment, present moment of our life is unnecessary baggage. And it's what interferes with the healing process and moving out of 20,000 cycles per second and into higher and higher levels of vibration. And what I'd like to do now is share with you what I think of as the essence of getting out of our personal history. You know, Alan Watts described it like this. He said, your life is like a boat, and it's heading up the river at 40 knots, and you're standing on the stern of the boat, looking down as the boat's heading in this direction, and you're looking at the water, and what you see before you is a wake. And he said, you have to ask yourself these three questions about the wake. The first question, what is the wake? And the wake that you're observing is just a trail that is left behind. That's what it is. It's just a trail that is left behind, if you can see that metaphor. And that's your life. And everything that's ever happened to you up until this moment, it's a wake. And the second thing is, what's driving the boat? That's the second question. That is, what's making your life go in this direction? And the answer to what's driving the boat is the present moment energy that's being generated by the engine. And nothing more. That's the only thing that makes the boat go. Now here's the most important question to ask yourself. Is it possible for the wake to drive the boat? That is, can a trail that is left behind make a boat go in this direction? And of course the answer to that is, it's impossible. Can't happen. And most of us, including those of us who are stuck in disease, are believing that the wake is what's causing me to be sick today, or causing this relationship to not work. And this woman, whose husband had left her, 
and who had to raise these children and had lived with all of these thoughts of how this shouldn't have happened and what a bastard he was and how wrong that was and so on, was living back here in the wake, believing that all of this stuff that was back here was causing her to be depressed, to be sick, to be unhappy, to be all of the things that she was, when in fact, it's just the way that she was processing that. It's the present moment energy that is generated by our thoughts that creates what it is that we are experiencing now. And if you can get out of the wake, or if you can teach your patients to get out of the wake, how many patients had come to you and told you that I've had back trouble my whole life? It runs in our family. My grandfather had it, my great-grandfather had it, my grandmother, of course I'm going to have it. And they're all in the wake. And they're all anticipating and expecting, and they're literally living this stuff that's back here. When in fact, they have a whole new set of options available to them if you can move into the present moment if you can move into the now and redirect the energy that you have into this moment. And if you're not doing that, I always say counseling is for better or for worse. And so is chiropractic. It's for better or for worse. If someone comes to you and you are operating on a spiritual level, at a lower level than the person who is coming to you, you will not only not help them, you'll get in their way. You'll get in their way. You have got to be at the knowing place. And so, if you can get out of the wake, you have really overcome the first obstacle to moving into higher levels of awareness. I'd like to suggest that if I could have a continuum up here on the stage, from point A being right here, and point B being in the center, and point C being over here by this podium, that on our physical health, for example, and I just want to talk about this for one moment, point A represents an absence of health, sickness. Point B represents, I feel all right. I feel okay. I have no symptoms. There's nothing wrong. Any place between A and B represents symptoms. Colds, headaches, flus, cramps, cancers, arthritis, subluxations, whatever you call all of that stuff that, uh, that is a part of your life, all right, that is uh, something called symptoms, is between A and B. B, I feel all right, but I'm capable of going back any time. And most of our treatment in our life is between A and B, whereas point C represents perfect health. This is where I not only feel fine, I feel as good as it's possible for me to feel. So if I were to say to you, how many of you in this room could join me at 6.30 on a 25-mile run without stopping? 25 miles. How many would be able to do that, know that they could do it? 25 miles. So maybe 5% of the audience. If I said I'd like you to sit down right now on the, and just move these chairs away and do 500 sit-ups with me, could you do 500 sit-ups? How many could do 500 sit-ups? Maybe 20% of the audience. And if I were to say to you, if we took a blood test or a urine test and we were to discover whether or not you had any toxins in your body, including things, anything that isn't good for it, like caffeines and nicotines and and illegal drugs of any kind, and legal ones and so on, how many would be able to pass that purification test? Would have a pure system? How many? Not very many. Listen to Abraham Maslow, my teacher. I've never forgotten these words. Self-actualizing people must be what they can be. There is something in them in here that says... I am capable of this, I know it, and I have to actualize it. And I will take no excuses from myself or anyone else. I must be what I can be. All right, if I were to move then over here to point A on an emotional level, and I were to say A represents an absence of emotional health, B represents, I feel all right, but anything in between, like anxiety, stress, nervousness, uh, fear, uh, depression, uh, being upset, and so on, is all here between A and B. And the further we get towards A, we're into things like psychosis and, you know, very serious mental illness. And here, as we move up towards B, 
we get to a point where it's just neurosis and it's just I'm, it's easy for me to be upset and if things are going okay now but if one of my kids screws up I'm capable of really going into uh, you know a very bad place and I can get hurt very easily and I can get depressed and so on all of that is back here and here you get to a point where you're okay and point C on this continuum represents perfect emotional health. This is the place where you have an awareness within you that says, I don't go back there any longer. What you think of me is none of my business. I am free from allowing myself to become immobilized or upset or in any way incapacitated on the basis of what is going on outside of me or how other people conduct themselves. I am in charge of my emotional life. I live at bliss. One of the teachers that's very profound and important in my life, I'm going to talk about it in a few moments, said is that you will know that you are reaching higher levels of awareness when you find yourself to be more frequently in a state of cheerfulness and bliss. That the yogis, the highest functioning people, are living at a state of bliss almost all the time. They're giddy. They're goofy. They're happy. They're excited. They're they see the world in a way in which they don't allow themselves to go down. And the more frequently you find yourself in that cheerful state, the more you're moving into this higher level of awareness. And I'm going to have to find this higher level of awareness in a few moments. So on these two areas of our physical health, most of us operate, and most of the people that you see in your offices are operating be somewhere between point A and B. It's very seldom, I would suggest, that you find someone walking into your office and saying, I feel great, but I'm not all that I can be. I want to be as healthy as it's possible for me to be. I want to feel terrific all the time. I want to have very high levels of energy all the time. My energy level is fine. I want to be in a state of grace physically. I want to be able to do all that I'm capable of doing. I'd like you to help me with that. So that's physical health and emotional health. Most of us want to get back to ordinary human awareness, point B. We want to move from 10, 8, 6,000 cycles per second and see if I can move myself up to ordinary human awareness. And I'll be satisfied with that. Fully functioning people, the people that uh, selected me to write about their ideas and how to apply it in Wisdom of the Ages, were all people that were operating at a very different level of consciousness. And so I'd like to just talk for a moment about this level of consciousness uh, on a continuum from A to B to C that doesn't include the physical and doesn't include the emotional, but it includes something called consciousness. And we hear this term bantered about all the time. Point A on this thing called consciousness represents the lowest level of consciousness. This is called individual consciousness or ego consciousness. I wrote a book a few years ago called Your Sacred Self. And in Your Sacred Self, I suggested that there are really only two people living inside each and every one of us. We all have these two people living inside of us. The first person that lives inside each and every one of us is called the ego. And this ego 
is really nothing you're going to ever get rid of through an egoectomy, all right? Uh, and you're not going to find it on any of your x-ray machines. This ego is just an idea. And it's an idea that we all have of who we are. And it's an idea that we've come to believe that who we are. And this idea says that who I am is what I have and what I do and what other people think of me. What I have, that is all of my, my stuff and how much it's worth and how, much, and how it compares to everybody else's. What I do, that is what I accomplish, what I've achieved, and my reputation, what other people think of me. This is the ego. And the ego's basic idea is that who I am is separate from everybody else. That's what makes me who I am. I'm separate. And I am separate from not only everybody else, but I'm separate from God. And I'm separate from all that I would like to attract into my life. And there's a, there's a pie that's out there. And this pie has uh, so many pieces to it. And if I don't get my piece of the pie, somebody else is going to get it for me. So I'm in competition with everybody that's out there. And it's a very competitive uh, dog-eat-dog, I've got to get someplace, I've got to be better than, I've got to be number one kind of mentality. This is ego consciousness, point A. And it's interesting, one of the more intriguing things that I learned when reading uh, Carl Jung, he said that as adults, you know, we reach adulthood, and we think that uh, once you reach adulthood that we're through with our development. But he said we go through these developmental stages, these developmental patterns, and when we reach adulthood, we continue to develop. Some do. And he said that there are archetypes, if you will. And he called these archetypes... Um, he said the lowest archetype that we have as adults is called the archetype of the athlete. And this is the time in our adult life when our primary emphasis is on uh, what we can do, on our body. How beautiful it is, how, how, how good it looks, how much hair it has. I used to actually use Brill Cream and things, you know. That's gone. Those days are gone. And I used to think that who I was was what I looked like. And then he said, if you get past the archetype of the athlete, you move into what he called the archetype of the warrior. And this is the stage where most people find themselves and where almost all disease takes place. The warrior is the time in our adult life when we take our physical bodies out into the world to do what warriors do. And what do warriors do? They compete, they fight, they conquer, they collect as much as they can. This is what we are as warriors. This is the time in our adult life when we set goals. This is the time in our adult life when we are looking at our own quotas. What's in it for me? How much can I get? Who can I defeat? Who I'm better than? You see them on television all the time. We're number one. No, we're number one in this kind of warrior mentality. And he said most people, particularly in the Western world, get stuck at this level of development. But he said there's a third and a fourth archetype. The third archetype is called the archetype of the statesman or the stateswoman. And this is the time finally in our adult life when we stop saying what are my quotas and what's in it for me and what can I get and we begin to say instead what are your quotas and how may I serve becomes much more of an important criteria then what am I going to get? And feeling connected to each other and to God and to what we would like to attract into our life, feeling connected to it rather than separate from it is the shift. There's a wonderful story. When I was in Phoenix and I was on radio station KTAR there in the morning with Pat McMahon, and he was so excited and anticipating that... Uh, Mother Teresa was coming to uh, visit the studio, and she was going to be on the radio. And he is an Irish Catholic, and to have Mother Teresa in the same studio, it was just the highest point of his life. He was so excited. And when she came in, the night before, she had been sleeping at the uh, homeless shelter that had been just dedicated there. And I don't know if you know this about Mother Teresa, but whenever she was away from her mission in Calcutta, she didn't eat. If she was away for 10 days, she didn't eat. She only drank water. 
and they would bring food to her wherever she was, if she was in Africa or if she was in Albania or if she was in Asia, and she would say, no, no, I just drink water when I'm away from the mission. And they said, but Mother Teresa, you're in your 80s. You can't just not eat for, for 10 days. Why would you do that? She said, because I have to know inside what the people that I serve are going through themselves. And this is the only way I know how to do it. I have to be able to experience it. And when she walked into the room, all of us knew that we were in the presence of a higher level of awareness. She was one of the people that selected me shortly after she died. In fact, the day that she died, I was speaking in Sydney, Australia, and someone came up and handed me a note just before I went on. It was 9 o'clock in the morning down there, but it was in the evening on the other side of the dateline. And I said, isn't that just like her? It was the day of Princess Diana's funeral to try to sneak out when no one was noticing. The whole world's attention was focused over here, and that's when she died. The selfless, egoless woman. And when she walked into the room, all of us knew that uh, we were in the presence of a different, that kundalini that I spoke about earlier, that, uh, that feeling of the shower inside of you, was in all of us. She's about four foot ten, maybe weighed 80 pounds at, the, at that. And Pat said to her, he said, Mother Teresa, is there anything that I can do for you? And this is someone who lived at the stateswoman consciousness or higher. And she said, no, Pat. She said, I'm just here to talk about the homeless shelter. And he said, uh, Mother Teresa, he said, we have a very powerful radio station here, 50,000 watts. He said, we could generate an enormous amount of publicity for your mission in Calcutta and what you are doing. And she said, you know, I'm really not here for publicity. It doesn't interest me, but, but thank you. I just wanted to tell the people of Phoenix about your wonderful shelter where I slept last night and, and how it can help people who don't have a home. And he said, but Mother Teresa, he said, and he did what the ego always goes to. He said, um, we could raise a lot of money here today. And she said, uh, I'm really not interested in money or even talking about it, but thank you very much. I just want to talk about the homeless shelter. Finally, Pat got down on his knees, and he almost begged her. He said, Mother Teresa, please, isn't there anything that I can do? And she said, there is one thing that you can do. You seem so serious, she said. She said, tomorrow morning, get up at 4 a.m. and go out onto the streets of Phoenix and find someone who's living there who believes that he's alone and convince him that he's not. That's what you can do. And I wept. And it's hard for me not to, even as I tell this story again and again, that the awareness that we're not alone, the awareness that um, we're connected, is an awareness that um, personifies the statesman or the stateswoman phase of your life. And I would suggest to you, those of you who are in practice, if you can get your egos out of your practice and really in your own hearts come from that place where you can teach people that they're not alone and that healing is not something that is done by someone outside of them, but that healing is something that takes place when you connect to your source when you reconnect to your source. When people ask me what my view of God is, I always say, I always see God as the ocean. And I see myself as a glass. And if I take this glass and I dip it into the ocean, I say, what do I have here? <clears throat> what I have here is a glass of God. It's not as big. And it's not as strong. But it's still God. And just like a wave on the ocean is what the ocean is doing, we are all what God is doing. And if you take one drop of that water and you put it right here and you say to that drop of water, separate from its source now, I'd like you to create and sustain life. And you watch. And what happens? It will evaporate, vaporize, 
it will change form and return to its source. It'll go back to the only place. There's only one source. There's only one water on the planet. And there are just all separate glasses and hoses and pitchers full of it. But there's one source. And so it returns in a different form, which is exactly what's happening in your life, by the way. You are changing form, and you'll return to your source. But while this drop of water is separate from its source, it loses the power of its source. It cannot create and sustain life because it is separate from its source. It's only when it reconnects that it regains that power. This drop of water right here, separate from its source, represents your ego. This is the part of you that has come to believe that you are separate. And as long as you believe that you are separate from your source and from each other, and from that which you would like to attract into your life, you will always lose the power of your source. And what is the power of the source? The power to heal. The most intriguing thing that I think I learned about healing was from Joel Goldsmith's uh, The Foundations of Mysticism. He said that healing is something that takes place because you bring spirit to the disease process. And he said these words, and this sounds a little strange, disease is an illusion. Disharmony is an illusion. Discord is an illusion. Because if it's not of God, it doesn't exist. And if it's not good, it's not of God. And therefore, that which is not good cannot exist because God creates everything. So the only reason that we believe that it exists is because it is something we create in our minds or through our minds. And when we learn to change our mind about it, it's like it's an error in thinking. And spirit nullifies disease, brings spirit to it. It's like in mathematics, two times two is four, has substance. It's always four. Two times two is nine, has no substance. And you can say it and say it, but the way that you eliminate it is by correcting it. The minute that you correct the error, it disappears. It's gone. And it's in the correction of the error. And that's why one of the most important prayers, and the one that I wrote an essay about in here, is from St. Francis. You know, I never understood this prayer until I read the Foundations of Mysticism about healing. And this is the most, probably the most widely used prayer in the world. He says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. That is, bring love to hatred and hatred disappears. That's healing. Where there is injury, pardon. Bring that to injury and injury disappears. Where there is doubt, faith or knowing. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. In other words, you correct the error of the illusion of disharmony, discord, and disease by bringing spirit to it. Let me share with you from my heart. I have six daughters and two sons, but I have a 16-year-old daughter, the only child that we have who has taken a different path in her life. And we've struggled with it. And she has, um, she had a, a, a very serious automobile accident. She had to be cut out of the car. She um, has taken a path of drinking and, and experimenting in drugs and so on. And, and I know that this is a path, and it's a very painful path, and she's had some very difficult times with it. And she's got a whole thing about authority and uh, uh, doing things her own way and so on. And I understand it because I've lived it my whole life. And every time, I must say that uh, in the last three or four months, there's been just incredibly dramatic shifts in our life. And it's because there has been a shift in how I and my wife are dealing with this. And I used to, when I would think about her, I would be filled with rage and filled with pain 
and I would be tearful and I'd be angry at, at the dumb choices that she would make and the things that she would do that just didn't seem to make sense. And it's, I don't know if you've raised teenage daughters, but I saw a wonderful title for a book about raising teenage daughters. It said, uh, Get Out of My Life. That was the title. But first, drive me and Cheryl to the mall. All right? It's a great book, by the way. And so I would be in my mind, and I'd be thinking about it, and I would try meditating, and I'd try working on it, and so on. <clears throat> and uh, it did, nothing seemed to work. And then I, would, I began to study this Foundations of Mysticism, this series of lectures by Joel Goldsmith, this great healer, lived back in the 1950s, wrote the uh, parentheses in eternity in the infinite way. Wonderful, wonderful readings. He was a Christian scientist and a very big supporter of chiropractic as well. And he talked about how we nullify disorder, disease, disharmony, and so on. And that, a reminder, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. These words that I say unto you are spirit. And he said, getting down on your knees and asking God to heal you, or getting down on your knees and asking God to grant you abundance where uh, scarcity resides, getting down on your knees and asking God for anything is a foolish mission. Because the assumption behind asking God to give you something is that God already has it, but he's holding it back. He said, Luke 15, 31 says, all that I have is thine. It's all yours already. And you are already connected to all that I have. And God, he said, isn't going to be doing anything different one hour from now than God is doing now. And God isn't going to be doing anything different an hour from now than God was doing a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. God is the infinite now. Don't assume that God is a withholding God. If I had the keys to healing you, to giving you abundance, to giving you a great relationship, to providing a job for you, whatever it is that you would like, and I held it all back, unless you begged for it or obeyed the rules that I said you must obey, you would say, you know, you're really not even a very nice person, let alone a very nice God. He said, you must know that you're connected to it already. And that the disease, the disharmony, the discord will be nullified, will be wiped out when you bring spirit to it. And as I would think about my daughter and the rage, I would feel myself as I was plugged into the physical, the laws of the material. And I would, in my own mind, I would unplug myself from the material and I would plug myself into God. It's a wonderful mental image when things aren't going the way you would like them to go. Just unplug yourself from the laws of the physical, especially where there's disharmony, disorder, disease, and plug into God. And what you do when you plug into God is you bring love, you bring pardon, you bring hope, you bring joy, you bring fulfillment to that, and you correct the error, and it's gone. I had a friend who was diagnosed with cancer and told that she had just a few months to live. And she knew that she was in disharmony. And she didn't even tell her parents. She didn't tell anyone. She knew what she had to do. She had read all the spiritual literature. She had immersed herself in meditation and deep prayer. But still, she was surrounded by and contaminated by the energy field of those who were living in fear and without faith. And she left and she rented a cabin up in Wisconsin, in northern Wisconsin. And she went there all alone. And in the process, what she knew she had to do for eight to ten hours a day, every day, was to just reconnect to her source. And in the process of doing this, of just communing with God, and just bringing peace. She came back from there a cleansed and whole person. And a healed person as well. It is in the bringing of spirit to disease. And that's why I say and said to you at the very beginning. You must be operating at a different level. The fourth archetype that Jung spoke about 
is called the archetype of the spirit. And the archetype of the spirit is the archetype where we begin to understand who we are, that this is not our home, that we are not these bodies, that we can become the witness to them, that there is something that transcends this physical world, and it is that which gives life. It is the spirit that gives life. As St. Paul put it, that which is seen hath not come from that which doth appear. The source of everything in the physical world is not in the physical world. It's in the world of spirit. So it's athlete, warrior, statesman, spirit. And ultimately you begin to have an awareness. And when they were introducing me, I heard the gentleman say that uh, he describes himself as an infinite soul disguised as a teacher, as a husband, as a father. But it is a disguise. Because I know that I am not a human being having a spiritual experience. I have finally come to know the truth, which is the reverse. That I, like you, am a spiritual being having a human experience. And as a spiritual being, I can look at and observe and notice my body and the whole material world. And I know that there's an energy that flows through all of it and that I'm connected to all of that. I said that I would like to talk about the three levels of consciousness, A being individual consciousness or ego consciousness. And I said that there are two people inside each and every one of us. The first one is the ego. The second person inside each and every one of us is what I call the sacred or the higher self. And this sacred or higher self really doesn't care whether we win or lose or how much we get or who we're better than or how much we have. It's not interested in that. This part of us that lives in every single one of us only wants one thing. It wants us to be at peace. At peace. And it wants to choose peace. As it says in The Course in Miracles, I can choose peace rather than this. I remind myself that every day when I drive my children to school in the morning and they're fighting over who called shotgun and who gets to sit in the front and who gets to push the buttons and who listens to the rap music and who said, Daddy's my turn this time. And they're going back and forth and I just remind them, I can choose peace rather than this. <laughs> and I said, look out or I'm going to push my button. And say, okay, okay, okay. They don't want to hear that crappy music or whatever. All right. The ability to choose peace. One of the selections that was most profound in my life that I wrote an essay about to, for 60 Days to Enlightenment in Wisdom of the Ages was uh, from Rabindranath Tagore, the great Indian poet, from a selection called the Gitanjali, which won the Nobel Prize for Poetry and Literature in 1927. He said, I went out alone on my way to my tryst, but who is this me in the dark? I step aside to avoid his presence, but I escape him not. He makes the dust rise from the earth with his swagger. He adds his loud voice to every word I utter. He is my own little self, my Lord. He knows no shame, but I am ashamed to come to thy door in his company. The ego just wants to be right. The higher self wants to be kind, wants to be at peace. And if you can just begin to shift that, just ask yourself, as what I'm about to say, I always tell people there's in, in counseling groups and so on, that there are four words, that if you learn these four words, they'll eliminate all conflict in all of your relationships. These four words are, you're right about that. No matter what it is somebody says to you, you give them that. You're right about that. Someone says, you know, you're really a jerk. So, you know... You're right about that. Because that doesn't make somebody right. She'll say something to me. You know, you're supposed to be home at 7.15 and it's now 6.30. There was a time when I used to say, wait a minute. You're not my mother. I don't have to explain to you when I come home. I'm not one that's out working. And who do you think support? Who do you think buys all these? You know, there was a whole, all that ego stuff that was a part of my life. You've all heard those before, right? Now I just simply say, you know, honey. She said, don't hold those four fingers up. I hate it when you do that. Now I notice she holds the four fingers up, but she's doing it one at a time. She's going like, you know. (laughs) 
But it's the idea that just as you're about to respond to somebody, instead of saying, well, I need to be right and I need to prove myself, I'm just going to stop. And just, I am not, no longer. And every single person that operates at these higher levels that I'm describing here tonight, that I've known, they have no need to be in charge, to be right, to be dominant. To be in, they allow themselves to, to realize as a, you know, the story of Buddha when he had someone following him around for three days and all they ever did was criticize him and find fault with him all the time. Everything he said, everything he did, they found... And always would, what would come out of him would be this peace and this love. And finally, after three days, the man who was criticizing him said, I don't understand. I've done nothing but insult you for three days and make a fool of you and you always respond with, with kindness and love. He said, how, could you, how can you do that? And the Buddha said these magical words. When someone offers you a gift and you don't accept that gift, to whom does the gift belong? So if someone offers you a gift of their anger, their hatred, their insult, but you don't accept it, who owns the gift? And why would you go around being upset about something that belongs to someone else? It's not yours in the first place. That's a higher level of awareness. That's being able to choose peace. And I've often said that the, uh, the person that you're the closest to in your life is not the person that agrees with you on everything. In fact, your soulmate is very often a person that you find you're in most disagreement with, you have a great deal of difficulty with. I say your soulmate often is the one you can hardly stand sometimes. They're your greatest teacher. I think in any relationship in which two people agree on everything, one of them is unnecessary. I know in my own life, uh, the people who can push buttons and send me into a frenzy are the people who are my greatest teachers. And why are they my greatest teachers? Because they teach me that I have not yet mastered myself. I don't know how to choose peace in these instances. I'm not in charge of myself yet. If anybody out there can push that button and send me into that place, I am still operating at ego consciousness. And my wife is very good at that. Any one of you can say anything to me, and I can say, you know, thank you for sharing. I'll really work on that. But if she says it, there's something about the way she does it, something about it. And it's all these years and all these children, and still she knows how to exactly push it. And, I, and I'll stop myself and say, you know, you still don't have it. You're still not. She's my teacher. I remember once saying to her that, honey, would you love me if I wasn't Wayne Dyer? If I didn't have the ability to take you to all the places we've gone to and buy you all the nice things and do all the wonderful things we can do in our life? She said, you call yourself a spiritual teacher? And you could ask me such a question? Right away, I started getting, going from blissed to pissed, all right? <laughs> I said, well, I was just wondering if I was just Joe Sixpack. And I was just bringing home, you know, a meager salary, and we were struggling from week to week trying to, you know, not have any month left at the end of the money. If, I was, if, that, if that's who I was, would you? She said, you think I love you? Because of what you can do for me, what you can buy for me? She said, that's an insult. She said, I love you for who you are. I always have, and I always will. I don't love you for what you can do for me. I said, that's just what I wanted to know. She said, I would miss you. <laughs> but I would always love you. She can do it. She can. The greatest line she ever came back with, and I was having a serious discussion with her. I said, honey, how come you never tell me when you have an orgasm? She said, you're never there. <laughs> of course you're there. Where else could you be? And she went into this, you know. Your teachers are the ones who can send you into those places. You know? My children are really good at it. My daughter, Serena, is the absolute best at it. You know? She can stand there. She said, there's a rumor in our school that you actually wrote a book about how to raise children. 
tell me it isn't true. She can get to me in any moment. She, she really knows how to do it. Her soulmate is her sister, Summer. They were having breakfast one morning. The funniest line I've ever heard any of my kids give. And I was uh, making breakfast. My wife was away working on a book of hers. And I heard Summer say to Serena at the breakfast table at 6.30 in the morning, if you didn't have any feet, would you wear shoes? Serena said, that's ridiculous. What are you talking about? What are you even talking to me this early in the morning for? I mean, if I didn't have any feet, would I wear shoes? Of course not. Summer said, then why are you wearing that bra? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they can be tough. I promised you that um, I would talk about consciousness and give you the seven principles, and I want to give those to you. Point B on the consciousness is called group consciousness. Individual consciousness is point A. That's the ego. Consciousness here of, of B is in the middle, is group consciousness. This is where we identify ourselves with the groups that we belong to. And group consciousness is a consciousness which is the source and cause of virtually all wars on our planet. This is where I am the groups that I've been assigned to. I am the culture that I grew up in. I am the geographical boundary. I was born on this side of the river. You were born on that side of the river. Therefore, you are my enemy and I must kill you. This is what's going on in all different places on the planet today. I am Jewish. You are Christian. Therefore, I am your enemy if I live in the Middle East. I am uh, uh, at war with you if I'm a Muslim and you're whatever. I am male. You are female. Therefore, we are in conflict. We're part of these different groups. I am northern, you are southern, I am conservative, you are liberal, I am democrat, you are republican. It's this dichotomy, it's this division, it's this identification with the groups that we've been assigned to, group consciousness. It's a higher level than ego consciousness, but it's still a very low level of awareness, and it's one that we have to move out of and understand that we live on a round planet, and on a round planet there's no choosing up sides. We are one. And that's what point C is on consciousness and what I've been leading to all afternoon. Point C represents mystical consciousness, unity consciousness, God consciousness, spiritual consciousness, healing consciousness. This is an awareness that I am connected to rather than separate from. Rumi put it this way. He's one of the people I dedicated uh, Wisdom of the Ages to and who wrote through me in here. He said, when you are dead, seek for your resting place, not in the earth but in the hearts of men, in the hearts of men. He put it this way, he said, I, you, me, he, she, they, these are distinctions which do not exist in the garden of the mystics. And I'd like you to think of yourself as a flower in the Garden of Mystics for a moment. And all that is possible when you become someone who's living at mystical consciousness. Mystical consciousness is one in which you have the ability to be able to raise your level of vibration from 20,000 cycles a second where disease and accidents and harm and discord and disharmony exist into a place of bliss. And you do it by the only way you can come to a knowing. And that is through making conscious contact with God. It's not learning about God, it's coming to know God. The first day that Deepak Chopra, my dear friend, whom I've put tapes out together with, we have some of them here, creating your world the way you want it to be and so on. We've spoken together in venues all over the world. He's one of my closest friends. And when we met in 1990 in person, the first thing he said to me when I walked up to him and he was standing around a group of people who he was signing books for was he put his hands together and he bowed. This is a medical doctor. They usually don't bow when they see me. Often they give me half a peace sign, all right? <laughs> and he said a Sanskrit word that means I celebrate in you 
the place where we are both one. It's namaste. Namaste. Say it. Namaste. It's a wonderful greeting. It's an awareness that we both share something, even though we may look like we're in separate bodies. And he handed me a book to read that night. And the book that he handed me is a book that I read from every day. It was written by a man named Patanjali, who lived in the third century before Christ. And the book's called How to Know God. And in this book, there was a passage. And I, I took this passage and I outlined it and I underlined it and I had it uh, laminated and I carried it with me and I still carry it with me. And, uh, but I know it by heart. And it's about inspiration. And it's the fourth or fifth essay that I wrote about in here in Wisdom of the Ages. He says, and the word inspiration, of course, comes from in spirit. The word information comes from inform. This has been called the information age. So we are loaded with information. We have more information accessible to us than any group of people ever has in our history. And yet we still have enormous numbers of struggling populations and people who don't understand this spiritual message. It isn't information that is going to bring us out of it. It's inspiration. It's moving into in spirit because it's the spirit that gives life. That which is seen, that is the whole physical universe, that which is seen hath not come from that which doth appear. The source of everything is not over here. It's in here, in the world of spirit. And he put it this way. And these words really resonate with me. He said, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all of your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction. And you find yourself in a new and a great and a wonderful world. And then he said something that I've never forgotten. He said, dormant forces, faculties, and talents come alive, and you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. Forces that you thought were not accessible to you come alive, and you discover yourself to be a far greater person than you ever dreamed yourself to be. And the way that we make this inspiration work is through something called conscious contact. It's called coming to know God. I was honored to participate in a collection of writings, which um, we have some here, called The Experience of God. Myself, Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, Louise Hay, Ram Dass, Bernie Siegel, Scott Peck, Joan Borzenko, and 30 others. People I'm honored to be in there. We all wrote about our direct experience, our direct conscious contact with God. I call this bathroom reading. And I mean you put it in your bathroom and you read from it each time you're in there. And it's like it's part of the metaphor of what I've been speaking about all afternoon. You bring spirit to that which is leaving. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Would you like a copy? There you are. Enjoy it. The experience of God. There's 40 of us that wrote in this. And making conscious contact with God through this thing called inspiration. When I'm inspired, I never ever get concerned about being hungry. I never get tired when I'm inspired. When I'm writing, I can go away and write for day after day. I sleep an hour a day, two hours a day. Drink nothing but water. Don't feel hungry. The right people always seem to show up. I go to the mailbox and the right, um, the, the thing that seemed to be missing before is always right there for me. The telephone rings. It'll be someone calling. And I, I wrote about some of that in Wisdom of the Ages. When I was stuck on something in, uh, when I was away writing this, one of these essays, uh, Deepak picked up the phone and only two people in the whole world knew my phone number where I was in seclusion. It was my wife and my other wife, Deepak. 
And I told him that, and I wrote about it in there. As, and, and he gave me something in that talk that it just put, like, they say it in Sanskrit that when the student is ready, the teachers appear. When you're ready, it's just a question of, in the moment that you're ready, you have this knowing. And when you have this knowing, you almost, but not quite, it borders on, you almost get arrogant about it. You have an awareness that I can attract now into my life what is missing. And I put my attention on that and my energy on it. And I stop giving energy to the things I don't believe in. Because when you put your attention or your energy on the things that you don't believe in, then what you don't believe in is what continues to show up. And when you put your energy and your attention on what you do believe in, then what you do believe in shows up. Because as you think, so shall you be. So if your thoughts are on what is, and you don't like what is, what is keeps showing up. Even though you despise it. If you despise what always has been, and that's what you think about is what always has been. This is the way I've always been. I've always had this kind of a uh, difficulty with this particular uh, ailment or whatever. Even though you hate having the ailment, if that's where your thoughts are, you will attract more of it into your life. And if your thoughts are on what they want for you or what they expect for you, even though you despise it, if what you think about is what expands is true, then what they want for you will continue to expand into your life, even though you despise it, even though you hate it. It's when you shift out of and off of what you don't want, what is, what always has been, the circumstances of your life, what others want or expect from you, and learn to put your energy and your attention on what you want and what you intend to create with passion, then it begins to show up in your life. It's astonishing. And the interesting thing about it, and I was going to talk more about it here, but I, don't, I won't have time, is like, what is the context in which you can move out of individual and group consciousness and into mystical consciousness or unity consciousness? It is only available, as far as I know, through this process called meditation. You can't do it any other way. And with meditation, the very opening essay in here was from P uh, Blaise Pascal and Pythagoras, two of the greatest scientists who ever walked among us. And Pascal in the 16th, 17th century said, all of man's troubles stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Most of us just don't know how to get quiet. And it is like, I, don't, I tell people, don't learn to meditate or don't practice meditation because it will make you feel younger, which it will. It'll even make you look younger, which it will. Because it takes the stress right out of your skin, right out of your life. Don't learn to meditate and practice meditation on a daily basis because it will give you the equivalent of a night's rest in 20 minutes, which it will. But learn and practice meditation because it is the only way that you can transcend the duality of the physical plane. Jesus was known as a non-dual being. No right, wrong, beginnings, ends, male, female, none of that. Only the one. And in silence, silence is like zero. You cut it in half and you still have only zero. You can't divide silence. It's the oneness. Melville said, God's one and only voice is silence. And in Moby Dick, he put it this way. He said, for as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all of the horrors of the half-lived life. I'd like to suggest to you that if you don't make that meditation a daily practice in your life, that you might want to really think very seriously about changing that. I was taught a meditation by a man in India whose name is Sri Guruji, whom I dedicated Manifest Your Destiny to. And it's a very simple meditation, and I'd like to just share you with it uh, just a, a couple of minutes about it. This meditation is called Japa, J-A-P-A. And it's a meditation in which you repeat the sound of the name of the divine for 20 minutes in the morning. 
and you repeat the sound of the name of that which of the sound of all that which is manifested into your life in the evening it's the creation meditation and the gratitude meditation the sound that is in the name of the creator in all languages Allah Krishna God Yahweh Kali Durga Ra Jehovah all have the sound ah and the repetition of the sound of ah if you look in the beginning and you read Patanjali, whom I have been studying every day for, for the last, well, since last August. He talks about the power of the sound of ah, and here's where you have to willingly suspend your disbelief. The power of the sound of ah is so, well, the opening words to the New Testament, when you get upstairs, take a look at it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Together. Deep breath. God. Everyone. God. This sound, as you repeat this sound each morning for 20 minutes, and put your energy and your attention on what you would like to attract and create into your life is the most magical and mystical and powerful meditation there is. It's the only sound that requires no effort. If you open your mouth and you don't move the four things that are required to move in order for a sound to come out, the tongue, the teeth, the lips, and the jaw, if you don't move any of them, the only sound you can make is, ah, watch. Ah, the moment that I move my teeth, my tongue, my lips, or my jaw, the sound changes. But when I move nothing, effortless perfection, I make the sound of God. And it's the sound, if you read all the way back through, and I studied this in depth, all of the traditions teach this sound. And when Guruji came to me, he wrote me a letter. He had read a, a book that I had written back in uh, 19... Uh, uh, 80s called you'll see it when you believe it and he said I've asked you to teach this meditation and to take no money for it so we have put out a CD called meditations for manifesting in which I guide you through it and four tracks an explanation of this entire meditation a guided 20-minute meditation in the morning an explanation of the evening meditation and a guided evening meditation using the sound of all that has manifested into your life, which is the sound of Om. Om. These two sounds, when combined, which is the last sound you make as you go off to sleep at night, are the sound of peace which is the sound of the higher self, or the sacred self. Listen. Shalom. And languages are comprised of sounds that were heard in ancient mystics. And all of the sounds that we use today are there. There's no accident. I have been teaching this meditation, and all of the prophets for this meditation go to uh, help people all around the world. We've sent some of it to the Columbine High School Healing Fund. We've sent it to the uh, people who were destroyed by Hurricane Mitch and so on. But I take no profits from it. It's a wonderful and a powerful meditation. And people say to me, can I manifest for other people? I say, yes. Several months ago, dear Dr. Dyer, I'm writing this letter to express my thanks for the positive changes you've made in my life. Several months ago, my mother gave me Manifest Your Destiny, and I read it immediately, blah, blah, blah. After reading the seventh principle, I immediately went out and bought the sound meditation tape and began using it daily. I always knew I possessed an ability to attract the object of my desire, but I did not know any concrete method other than goal setting and positive thinking. He says, I identified four conditions in my life in which I set out to manifest and create change. The first was that I wanted my wife, Kathy, to be healed of what had been diagnosed as benign essential familial tremor uncontrollable and constant shaking of her head. The second was that I wanted her to be healed of a bulging disc in her back, which was causing her an incredible amount of pain. The third condition in which I set out to change 
was that I wanted Kathy to quit smoking for her health and the career and the health of our two young children. And the last desire that I set out to manifest was a new career for myself, which would bring me and my family increased wealth and abundance in our lives. Within weeks, I began receiving incredible results. One day out of the blue, I noticed that Kathy's head was barely shaking. After a couple of years of her head shaking constantly, one day it just stopped. The specialists at UCLA had told her that it was incurable, would be around her whole life, and was not even controllable, even with medication, which she had elected not to take. The next thing I noticed was that she suddenly stopped suffering from her back pain. There's been no mention of back pain since. The next almost miraculous result was that on January the 1st, 1999, after 15 years of smoking cigarettes, Kathy quit smoking, and so on. If there's no place that God is not, then God is in everything and everyone, including you, and all that you would like to manifest and help to heal. And the idea of being able to create things for ourselves, well, I have about 150 of these letters. This is the last one I'll share with you. She says, in May of 1997, I was terminated from my job of 10 years as a nurse. Now, it wasn't for some stupid mistake. I didn't hurt anyone, and my care actually saved a man's life. I just happened to give my opinion once too often to the wrong person. She said, tact is not one of my finer skills. Anyway, it was with this new life challenge I set out to find a new job, and what an experience. I honestly told every prospective employer the circumstances of my departure, and all of them said they would be hire me on the spot based on my honesty alone, but I still was unemployed. It was getting close to the end of my savings, and still I had no job. It was at this desperate point I pulled out your CD, Meditations for Manifest. I figured I had nothing to lose and thought it would be a good way to test if God was really listening to my prayers. I love this, testing God. My logical mind said, of course, but I was full of fear and doubt. So on a Friday night, after my family was in bed, I set up the CD, drew a hot bath, lit a candle and said, if you're listening, this is what I would like in my next job. It will be here by Monday morning. It's very pushy. I will make at least $15 an hour. I'll wear the same uniform so I won't need to buy new ones. It will be close to my home within 15 miles. I will work only day shifts and every third weekend. I then did the ah and oh meditation as you prescribed on the CD. I did it again the next morning and again on Sunday. And then I checked the newspaper, and there under the ads for nurses was one position, RN, every third weekend, good salary, apply in person. Monday, I put on my suit, and off I went. I was hired on the spot with everything that I asked for except the uniform. So I wore them anyway for a week while I waited to order new clothes. Well, the staff liked them so much that they changed the dress code to my new uniforms. Now, is that something or what? She says, I have to be honest, since I did that meditation and it worked so well, I have not done it since. Not because I haven't needed help here and there, I've just been afraid of the awesome power divine has, and more so the responsibility it takes to work with the divine. Talking to God, she says, and concludes, is not for sissies. I was blessed to go to a woman who lives at unity consciousness and is egoless. There are two ways to reach this enlightened stage. The 60 essays that I wrote in here are designed to help you reach it, but that's for those of us who incarnated with an ego and are working at trying to rid ourselves of it. This woman, her name is Mother Mira, who sees 200 people every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday at sitting darshan in Hadamar outside of Frankfurt, 40 kilometers north of Frankfurt. This is a woman who, when she was a child, she would have lights emanating from her body people in her presence would be healed, much like Sai Baba, whose picture I always have with me, who is a manifester and has manifested for me, Vibhuti, that has never gone down, even though I give it away on a regular basis. Mother Mira is a divine soul that my wife went to see and encouraged me to go to. And when I went and she held my head in her hands and she looked into my eyes, I felt that I was in the presence of God. For the very first time in my life, I had never known such divinity. When Deepak went to see her, he said he felt exactly the same way. And she has followers all over the world, and she teaches nothing but peace. And in a book, which is a series of questions that were asked to her in Sanskrit and her answers, on the back of this book, it says this, I suggest to you that you do your job and your duties wholeheartedly, 
and joyfully and bring peace and happiness in your family and in your surroundings. Do japa, which is the chanting or repeating of the name of God, and ask for whatever you want, and you shall receive it. It's the meditations for manifesting that Guruji said to me, when people begin to practice it in their life for the first time, they are alarmed and astonished at what happens. When I began practicing japa, my writing shifted from struggling to the most peaceful and blissful experience I've ever known. My speaking became fluent and easy and effortless. My relationship with my wife and my children changed dramatically. And I have a huge portrait of Mother Mira in our home. And I do meditation, this meditation, every day of my life. And I can't tell you how blissful and peaceful it makes me feel. Meditations for manifesting. Would you like one? Enjoy it and practice it each day. And if you don't like the results, send it back to me and I'll give you a refund because it's not about money. So we've come close to the end. I had promised you I would give you and share with you these seven principles that I jotted down on healing. I've covered most of them, but let me just share them with you as we depart. Seven observations for healers. Here's what Patanjali says. When a person becomes steadfast in his abstention from falsehood, he attains the power. You won't be able to write fast enough to do this. He attains the power of obtaining for himself and others the fruits of God of good deeds without having to perform these deeds. Now, let me, let me tell you what this means. When a person becomes steadfast in his abstention from falsehood, that doesn't mean he stops lying. It means he no longer identifies himself with the ego. He identifies or she identifies himself or herself with the spirit. I am no longer what I have, what I do, and what others think of me. I am the beloved. I am connected to God. When Sai Baba was asked the question in front of over a million people, are you God? This man who performs miracles, this man who has the gift of fish and loaves, he said, yes, I am. And so are you. He said, the only difference is that I know it and you doubt it. When Patanjali identifies the false self, or rather falsehood, as identifying with the false self. Vivekananda, a great student of Ramakrishna, when he was asked the question, how do I reach this higher level of consciousness, he put it this way. He said, in the springtime, go out and observe the blossoms on the fruit trees. He said, the blossoms vanish of themselves as the fruit grows. So too will the lower self vanish as the divine grows within you. Let the divine grow within you. Bring spirit too. Secondly, when a person becomes steadfast in his abstention from harming others, all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in his presence. This is St. Francis. When you no longer, when you are steadfast in your abstention from ever wanting to harm, that is, think harmful thoughts towards others, all living creatures will experience love in your presence and will be tamed. Third, to know the inner nature of an object or a person is to gain power. As the aspirant, that is each and every one of us, grows in concentration, he may find himself suddenly possessed of psychic powers. He may be able to heal the sick, to read others' thoughts, to foresee the future, or to control certain natural forces. And all it takes is a power of concentration, meditation, and absorption. As you go there, you will begin to see yourself healing and having these powers that you thought were not available to you. Fourth, when a person's energy field reaches the highest, most complex vibrations from imagining or meditation, the person had spiritual experiences regardless of their beliefs. As you begin to vibrate at 100,000 cycles per second, these experiences will be there whether you want them or not. Fifth, 
It is only possible, and this is always very intriguing to me, it is only possible for God to express God's self in you when you are at peace. If you're not at peace, you have sent God out of your life. And when you send God out of your life, you send healing and miracles and all the things I've been speaking about. Sixth, disease and discord have no power over you except through your belief in them. Disease has no power over you except through your belief in it. Let go of the belief in it, and it no longer has power over you. And finally, from the Koran, whatever good you have is all from God. Whatever evil, all is from yourself. God is that which is good. You bring it to discord, and you nullify disease. There's a, uh, a wonderful book that has just come out, and I brought a case of them with me. And it was written by a woman that I've come to know. Her name is Araya Mountain Dreamer. I told you that I gathered 60 people together. These 60 people that I gathered together, all of whom had these qualities of self-actualization, independence of the good opinion of others, detachment from outcome, no investment in power over others, the ability to see beauty and truth everywhere, a sense of passion in their lives, the ability to live in the now rather than the past, a real strong sense of passion and peace in their lives. And I'd like you to really listen to these words. I would imagine if all 60 of these people that I selected and have been talking about in wisdom were to come up with a document, it might look like this. This was a woman who went to a cocktail party and all they talked about was ego. What I have, what I do, what others think of me. And she just couldn't take it anymore because when you begin to move into a faster vibrational pace, you no longer are content to deal with drapery talk. It just isn't something you're interested in any longer. And you don't want to hear it. And you don't want to be angry and you don't want to be uh, arrogant and you don't want to be rude. You just want to decontaminate your energy field from that kind of consciousness. And this is how she was feeling. And she went home sort of disgusted with uh, how everyone was talking about how important they were and so on. And she wrote an invitation, which has subsequently been released as a brand new book. And this is what she said. It doesn't interest me what you do for a living. I want to know what you ache for. And if you dare to dream of meeting your heart's longing. It doesn't interest me how old you are. I want to know if you will risk looking like a fool for love, for your dream, and for the adventure of being alive. It doesn't interest me what planets are squaring your moon. I want to know if you have touched the center of your own sorrow, if you've been opened by life's betrayals, or have become shriveled and closed from fear of further pain. I want to know if you can sit with pain, mine or your own, without moving to hide it, or fade it, or fix it. I want to know if you can be with joy, mine or your own, if you can dance with wildness and let the ecstasy fill you to the tips of your fingers and toes without cautioning us to be careful, to be realistic, or to remember the limitations of being human. It doesn't interest me if the story you are telling me is true. I want to know if you can disappoint another to be true to yourself, if you can bear the accusations of betrayal and not betray your own soul. I want to know if you can see beauty even when it's not pretty every day and if you can source your own life from its presence. I want to know if you can live with failure, yours and mine, and still stand on the edge of the lake and shout to the silver of the moon, yes. It doesn't interest me to know where you live or how much money you have. I want to know if you can get up after a night of grief and despair, weary and bruised to the bone, and still do what needs to be done to feed the children. It doesn't interest me who you know or how you came to be here. I want to know if you will stand in the center of the fire with me and not shrink back. It doesn't interest me where or what or with whom you have studied. I want to know what sustains you from the inside when all else falls away. It, I want to know if you can be alone with yourself and if you truly love the company you keep in those empty moments. The invitation. 
A beautiful book. Each chapter is based upon one of those observations. You have a daughter that is blind. Would you like to read this to her? There you are. Thank you. God bless you. You're welcome. At the invitation. And Lao Tzu put it this way. At birth, all people are soft and yielding. At death, they are hard and stiff. All green plants are tender and yielding. At death, they are brittle and dry. When hard and rigid, we consort with death. When soft and flexible, we affirm greater life. Have a mind that's open to everything. Attach nowhere. Listen to the spirit. Play it every day. Do japa. Move from 20,000 cycles per second into a higher and higher frequency. And understand this line from A Course in Miracles. In every moment of your life, you have this choice. You can either be a host to God or a hostage to your ego. God bless you and thank you for coming. You honor me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a Hay House audio production. If you would like a free catalog of books and videos offered by Hay House, please call us at 1-800-654-5126 or visit www.hayhouse.com.